Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And for today's uh, talk, I'm actually tasked to explain or introduce the concept of geology to most of the young people who are attending this webinar today. So the title of my talk is, Why on Earth Do We Study Geology? And please be guided by this uh, simple outline for the duration of my talk. And to start with, um, first we should define what is uh, geology, no? So the term geology actually comes from the term ge, which means earth, and logos, which actually means uh, study. So basically, whenever we uh, talk about geology, it's the study of the earth, including the earth's origin and history, and of course, the processes that shape it and the resources that could be obtained from it. And this term was actually first introduced by Ulysses Aldrivande in 1603. And geology as a scientific discipline actually um, tries to address at least three important issues. And the first of which should be the relevance of time. Because for us geologists, it's very important to actually uh, look at the present conditions and try to use this um, present knowledge that we have and try to correlate it to what, uh, what possibly happened in the Earth's past or history. Okay, so if you look at this uh, figure being shown here, this actually shows the geologic time scale. So it's a very simple cartoon actually showing a uh, present day uh, setting all the way down, uh, all the way back to the time when the Earth was first formed, which is roughly 4.6 billion years ago. Now, the next thing that we need to take care of as geologists would be the issue of scale. So when we talk about scale, it means that normally, like as you can see here in these photos, the photo on the left actually shows a deformation of rocks at the outcrop scale. So meaning if you go out on the field, we can see that these rocks are actually uh, deformed. And then when we try to analyze these rocks at the microscopic or laboratory in the laboratory, at, even at the microscopic scale, we can also still observe this uh, deformation, which we actually observe in the field. And then lastly, uh, just like any other field of science, geo, uh, in the field of geology, we also try to replicate naturally occurring systems or phenomena in the laboratory. Now, you may be asking, what exactly do we do as geologists? No? So, Maybe you've watched uh, several movies and you've seen uh, these characters here and um, which actually portray some geologists in some of these movies. So I'm not sure if the depiction is quite correct, but at least for this afternoon, I would also like to share what I actually do as a geologist. So um, if we look at geology, just like any branch of uh, science, it has different subfields. It has quite a lot of subfields, and it also has um, several overlaps with other fields of sciences, such as chemistry, uh, physics, um, biology, even. No? And the other uh, guest speakers for today, I think, will also be discussing some of this, um, some aspects of these uh, subfields of geology. For my part, I'm actually an igneous petrologist and geochemist. So when you say you're a petrologist, it's your business to know how rocks are actually formed. And in particular, I study igneous rocks. So if you remember, there are three types of rocks, uh, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. So for now, I'm quite interested with igneous rocks. And I try to explain how these rocks are formed by looking at their uh, various characteristics. And then when we say geochemistry, this actually means that you're looking at the chemical characteristics of these rocks and also trying to explain how these character characteristics or what are the processes which actually led to the, this particular characteristics of these igneous rocks. So let me just uh, share um, in the next slides uh, the type of uh, science that I, I am actually doing as an igneous petrologist and geochemist. So if some of you could, uh, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the layers of the earth. So basically we have uh, core mantle and crust and 
among these different layers, I'm sure most of us would be quite familiar with the crust because that's where, where we are right now. However, if we look at the thickness of these different layers of the earth, one of the thickest layers would actually be the mantle. Okay, so the mantle could be further subdivided into the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And we, while there are some ideas as to what, what materials are present in the mantle, it's quite difficult to directly access the deeper portions of the earth. So as of now, nobody's been to the mantle or the core of the earth and then came back and said na, oh, ito yung mga rocks na and sa ilalim. Okay, we practically know more about the moon than what actually is beneath our feet. Okay, so for my work, I'm quite interested with what rocks are actually present in the deeper portions of the earth. Now, to address this issue of um, not being able to access the deeper portions of the earth, there are actually rocks exposed on the surface of the earth, which are actually thought to be representative of the deeper portions of the earth. And we call these sequences as ophiolites, okay? And this cartoon in the left actually just shows the different lithologies which comprise an ophiolite. So it's basically a sequence of rocks which are thought to be representative of the crust and the mantle, which is now abducted or exposed on land. And this cartoon here on the right just shows us how these ophiolites are actually formed. So during collision of um, plates, during tectonic movement, it's very possible that this um, oceanic sequences, which is comprised of crust and mantle rocks, would be exposed on land. And so we see them on the Earth's surface as ophiolites. So for example, now you're looking at uh, photo, uh, a photo of rocks comprising the Oman ophiolite. So you have here on the left periodotites, which are clear, uh, which are believed to be uh, rocks comprising the mantle. And then here on the right, these are uh, exposures of gabbros, which are rocks which are thought to be representative of uh, the lower crust of the Earth. Now, uh, here in Oman, this is one of the best places on Earth where we can actually study uh, ophiolite formation because due to, the, uh, due to the weather and climate in Oman, uh, the area is not so vegetated. So you can clearly see the samples as you can see in this photo. And I fortunately had the opportunity to participate as a field scientist in Oman way back in uh, 2017 where we tried to look at uh, some of the rocks belonging to the Oman ophiolite. Now, we don't have to go that far. We don't have to go all the way to Oman if we want to study ophiolites because here in the Philippines, we do have a lot of these ophiolites. So if you look at this map, this is actually a map showing ophiolites in the Philippines. So everything here shown in red field would actually be rocks uh, comprising ophiolites. So um, if we want to understand how these rocks are formed, the Philippines would be a very good laboratory to actually do this kind of work. And then another way to also further assess what materials actually comprise the mantle would be uh, looking at xenoliths. Okay, so xenoliths are fragments of rocks from the deeper portions of the earth, which are transported to the surface due to volcanic activity. So uh, if you're looking at this cartoon here on the left, this is a schematic diagram showing subduction. So whenever we say subduction, it just means that one of the plates is subducting or going beneath another. And because of this process, we actually generate magma. And magmas, when they're able to actually extrude all the way to the surface, then they form the lavas. And within these lavas, if uh, there are trapped materials, the deeper portions of the earth, we actually see them as xenoliths, as you can see here in the picture. So the greenish part would be mantle material, and then the black part would actually be volcanic rocks. So here in the Philippines, since we have a lot of volcanoes, this is also a good opportunity to actually study uh, mantle materials through xenoliths. So shown here in this slide would be some of the xenoliths which we actually collected from Mount Pinatubo during one of our field works there uh, several years ago. So for the benefit of the high school students who are here who might be asking what exactly do we do 
to understand these rocks, usually we gather the rock samples from the field. So uh, we, I mean, we, we, as part of our work, we do go out in the field and travel and use different modes of transportation to collect these samples. And once we have the samples, we try to make pin sections. So what do we mean by pin sections? So you cut a very small piece of rock, you polish it until it's very thin. And then it, when it's very thin, light can actually penetrate through the sample, even if it's a rock sample. No? And then we use small microscopes such as this one to actually look at the texture and what type of minerals actually comprise this rock. So at the outcrop scale, or maybe in the field, Maybe some of these rocks don't look so interesting, but actually they're quite beautiful when you start to look at them under the microscope. So for example, if you look at this, um, this, this photo micrographs here, these pictures are actually pictures of rocks analyzed under the microscope. So you, all these different colors actually indicate various minerals which are uh, which commonly comprise uh, peridotites, which are common rocks comprising the Earth's mantle. And then once we're done with the petrographic or the, I mean, looking at the textures and the minerals, we also analyze these rocks using a different, using different uh, geochemical equipment, such as this one here. This is the electron probe microanalyzer at our institute. And with this, we usually determine the uh, chemical properties or characteristics of the rocks that we are analyzing. So we go back to having shared what I'm doing right now. We go back to the main title of my presentation. No? Why on earth do we study geology? And let's try to bring the discussion quite closer to home and try to apply this question in the Philippine setting. Now, if we look at the geology of the Philippines, the Philippines is actually an island arc system. So I'll be explaining what an island arc system is and its consequences in the succeeding slides. So here on the left is a map showing the location of the Philippines. And if we look at this one, we're actually bounded by the Philippine Sea Plate to the east and the Eurasian Plate here to the west. Okay, now if we further zoom in into the Philippines, we can uh, simplify the tectonic features in the Philippines into the Again, the Philippine Sea Plate here in the east, the Philippine Mobile Belt, and then Sundaland here in the west. So when we say Sundaland, it's just the leading edge of the Eurasian Plate. Now, if we try to, um, if, sorry about that. If we look at this um, lines here, bounding the Philippine archipelago, these are what we actually call as subduction zones. Itong, uh, this lines with the uh, field uh, black triangles, okay? So in subduction zones, normally we form island arc systems or island arcs. Now, we need to define what an island arc is. So an island arc is basically a long curved chain of active volcanoes with intense seismic activity. And as I mentioned earlier, they are usually located along convergent tectonic plate boundaries. So if you look at this cartoon on the left, this shows um, an oceanic lithosphere being subducted beneath another oceanic lithosphere. And then because of the magnetism that is, or the magmas that are generated here in this portion of the earth, then usually this will form uh, volcanoes once the magmas are actually extruded on the earth's surface. So, a very good example of an island arc would be the Philippines. So if you look at this photo on the, I mean, this figure on the right, this actually shows in particular the extent of the Luzon Arc, one of the major arcs in the, Philippine, in the Philippines. So the Luzon Arc is a series of active volcanoes extending from southern part of Taiwan all the way to northern Mindoro. Okay, so Luzon Arc is just one of the many arcs or many volcanoes that we actually have here in the Philippines. And of course, uh, because of the, uh, the setting of the Philippines, which is an island arc, it comes with the territory or it comes with the setting that we are actually exposed to geologic hazards or what we call as geohazards. So 
For example, if we look at this map here on the right, which shows um, more details about the tectonic features in the Philippines, we can see here that we actually have um, the South China Sea Basin, which is subducting along the Manila Trench. And then we have here the Sulu Sea Basin, which is subducting along the Sulu Negros Trench. And further south, we have here the Celebes Sea Basin, which is subducting along the Cotabato Trench. And then here on the western, I mean, on the eastern uh, margin of the Philippines, we have the Philippine Sea Plate, which is uh, actively subducting along the East Luzon Trough and the Philippine Trench. So we can imagine that the Philippines is actually being um, sandwiched by the subduction zones and bali na iipit siya from both sides of, I mean, from, the, from both the eastern and western side of the Philippines. And then... To accommodate this um, pollution or compression and uh, subduction that is ongoing along these different systems, we actually have the Philippine Fault Zone, which cuts across the entire archipelago from here in the northern part all the way down to eastern uh, Mindanao. So because of this, because of this uh, tectonic setting of the Philippines, which is, again, an island arc setting, we are very prone to earthquakes. Because usually, if we if there are subduction zones and there is movement with the plates involved, then we can easily get earthquakes. So shown here on the map on the on the right would be locations of earthquakes. Okay, so you have here magnitudes four all the way to magnitude eight. So the bigger the circle, um, the higher the magnitude or the stronger the earthquake. And then if we look at the colors, it also shows us the depth at which these earthquakes actually occur. So if we look at this map here on the right, it clearly shows us that we do get a lot of earthquake events here in the Philippines. And another thing is that if we also try to specify and just look at uh, high magnitude earthquakes, we actually have earthquakes of greater than magnitude six all the way to eight. And the distribution of these earthquakes would actually be located quite close where we have um, present day or ongoing uh, subduction. So as you can see here in this map on the left, the red circles indicates areas where we, were, we experienced uh, high magnitude or high magnitude earthquakes. And then, in, of course, we all know that when big earthquakes happen, this could be very devastating. So a very good example of this would be the 1993, I mean, the 1990 Luzon earthquake. And then we also have the more recent one, which would be the April 22, 2019 Casillas earthquake, which was a magnitude 6 earthquake. And then in addition to earthquakes, we also have volcanoes. So as I've said earlier, because of the subduction of plates and for which eventually formed the volcanoes in island arcs, then in the Philippines, we should not be surprised that we actually have a lot of volcanoes. Because it, as I've said, it comes with the, it's because of our tectonic setting. Okay, so if we look at this map here, if you look at this map here on the left, we actually show, this actually shows uh, different volcanoes depending on the color. Uh, these are, um, you can see volcanoes which are active, pot potentially active as well as inactive volcanoes. And we do quite have a lot and most of these volcanoes are distributed from the north all the way to the southern part of the Philippines. Okay, so, and of course, um, we had had very um, infamous or infamous volcanic eruptions that, such as the June 12, 1991 uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption, which has a volcano explosivity index of six. So for volcanoes, we measure the degree or intense, uh, the violence of the eruption using this volcano explosivity index. And then uh, more recently, we also experienced um, the Taal volcano eruption, which has happened last year, and even currently as we speak, Taal volcano is still showing some signs of activity that it is an active uh, volcano. And then um, if we look at um, 
The PVOX website also listed there with the other several active volcanoes in the Philippines. So these are just some of the examples that uh, I was able to um, I was able to uh, reflect in this map. So show, as I've said, from the north to the southern part of the Philippines, we have a lot of active volcanoes. While at the moment, Taal is very popular. We may we do have other volcanoes elsewhere that are also showing. Uh, some signs of volcanic activity. And then, in addition to this uh, volcanoes and earthquakes, another thing that we need to also understand is that due to our location of the Philippines, which is quite close to the equator, we are also very, very prone to typhoons. Okay, so basically, if you look at these figures on the left and on the right, this uh, shows typhoon tracks of typhoons which are actually formed in the Pacific Ocean, which is located east of the Philippine Sea, okay? So if you look at from 1980 to 2005 data, we can no longer even see the Philippines. Sa sobrang daming typhoons which actually pass through our country. And then this one on the right shows uh, typhoon tracks for 2021. And the year is not yet finished, but we already have several typhoons also um, passing through uh, uh, the Fili Philippine area of responsibility. So, of course, with this typhoon, some of these typhoons actually bring with it rains as well as strong winds. So, in the case of strong rains, I mean heavy rainfall, uh, this could lead to other hazards such as flooding. Like you're looking at some photos here of uh, extreme flooding in Metro Manila during Ondoy. And then in some cases, this could also cause landslide in mountainous areas such as the 2006 uh, Ginza Ogon landslide in southern Leyte, and of course the 2015 landslide in Baguio. And then lastly, if the winds of these typhoons are quite strong, they can also cause uh, storm surges wherein the intensity of the wind can actually pick up the water kasi sobrang lakas niya, and, most, and actually causes this sea water to actually inundate on land causing storm surge and, of course, damage to houses located uh, along the coast. So if we actually look at all these things, we can, we can simply um, deduce and understand that being here in the Philippines is quite... Um, we are living dangerously in the sense that we are always exposed to these hazards. So if we go back to the question, why on earth do we need to study geology? It's because uh, we, need a, we need a good understanding of how these processes are actually affecting us directly. And as said by Will Durant, civilization exists by geological consent, subject, subject to change without notice. So if we want to survive, we definitely need to have a better understanding of uh, geology. And that's the end of my talk, and thank you for listening.